All right. Um, first of all, I want to I want to thank the, the media to be here. Um, in all sincerity, uh, as a civil rights attorney over 21 years, we've seen <clears throat> the importance of the role that you play, and I can tell you from state, local, national, international, on all grounds. So, we appreciate you here, and I appreciate you telling the story. But in all sincerity, there was a bad story told back in the day, uh, and of course in the late 80s, and that's not the story that we want, and that's not the story that was true. What the story is true right now, it's basically coming straight from the source himself, Rick Wershey, and his family. So he's here today to basically um, seek justice about what has happened to him and on all those years that he had to suffer and go through. Uh, uh, share it with me, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, just come on in here. Share with the stand. Come on, share with me. So, in all sincerity, uh, this suit is about the chickens have come back to roost. You know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And today, the Wershey family is truly speaking truth to power. And that is exactly what it is, it's truth to power. Power is what has led Mr. Wershey on this nightmare of 32 years and seven months that he had to endure. Mr. Worshi was at a tender age of 14, 14 years old. A couple of years he was in the Boy Scouts. We have pictures of him being in the Boy Scouts, all American Boy Scouts. He didn't ask for this. This was brought to his doorsteps. At 14, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, approached him, said, get in the car. This is what you're going to do. You know, in these days and times, you need a parent to say, hey, you know, uh, yeah, you can talk law enforcement, police, you can talk to my child. The FBI, the most powerful law enforcement agency in this country, told him, get in the car on his way back from school and this is what you're gonna do we're gonna give you money you're gonna go in these drug houses you're gonna go with dealers killers murderers drug kingpins hang out at we're going to give you drugs, we're going to give you money, and we're going to give you everything you need. Falsified documents, whatever you need, we're going to send you in this hellhole, the lion's den, to make sure that we get the information that we want. At 14, who in their right mind could say no? We see all around the country that children are told to come in vehicles or do this or do that. But when you have a federal, actual official law enforcement individual, we're not just talking about you know, city, municipality, county, or state. We're talking about the federal government, the Federal Bureau of Investigation that says to this 40-year-old, where the damn FBI? Get in the car. And this is what you're going to do. Gave him fake IDs, gave him money, gave him drugs, and said, go in and deal as you are a dealer in this world of 19, late 1980s Detroit. Remember, all of you, I think most of you here are here from Detroit, murder capital of the world. And this is what you're going to do. It shocks the conscience that someone will say to a child, do this. But no, it didn't stop there. It's like that was not already dangerous enough. Yeah, they started out with, hey, tell me who this is. Show me some pictures. That's normally how it stands out. Do you know, oh yeah, I know from the community, this, 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 and that. But it didn't stop there. That's one thing. But they said, again, 
go into these go into this dangerous drug world, killers, murderers, and do A, B, C, and D. After that, he did what they wanted. They signed, not as Rick Worsey Jr., but as his dad, Rick Worsey Sr. But that in of itself, you media folks, some of you are attorneys. Charlie, I ain't pointing the fingers. But the fact is that there's a reason for that. And the reason was they didn't want to expose that a child was working for the FBI. Lord willing, he is the youngest FBI informant, confidential informant, CI as we have them in the FBI 302s, in the history of this nation. He is the longest serving non-violent juvenile offender in the history of the state of Michigan. He is many things to help our government. So, doing all this activity and putting his life in danger was not pure speculation. It was real. It was absolutely real. And what they did is they Send them out, give them drug money, give them the drugs, tell them go ahead and go all these violent venues and what have you. And guess what? Some of the Curry Gang folks were on to him. And they put out a hit. Not a, not a 30 or 40 or 70 year old. They put out a hit on a 15 year old. A hit. That's how dangerous this individual was. He was hit. He got shot by the individual that he knew. And they tried to grab him and put him in a car to take him and let him out to die somewhere else. And thank God, by the will of God, that the paramedics showed up and blocked that vehicle from leaving that evening when Rick Worshi was 15 years old. Now, common sense dictates that, oh my God our informant, our so-called illegal informant, unlawful informant, has just got shot. He's 15 years old, for God's sake. Let's pull him out. Let's pull him out. They didn't do that. You know what they did? I said, oh, this is a great opportunity to show your loyalty to the streets. They said they came to the hospital that night. This is the FBI and the uh, Detroit police and said, pretend that it was an accident, that you weren't really intentionally shot, and play along. Instead of pulling this kid, this child out of danger, immense danger, they said, keep going. Pretend it was an accident. Not only did they not pull him out, but they increased his activity and the uh, uh, operations that he was dealing with. So Rick Worshi continued to go on and on. Until finally, Rick Worshi became a known name. The media got a hold of it. Um, and basically said, you know, this is AKA drunk kingpin, what have you. All that was false, but they played, but they played it out. And a lot of folks don't even know it wasn't just the one time that he was shot, like the documentary or the Hollywood movie says. But he had number of attempted assassinations or killings on his head, a number of them. We heard in the documentary the individual that killed what 34 people. He was hired to kill Rick Worshi. There was one time they shot up his house. Bullets sprayed right through by his father's head in the home. There was another time that they pulled up at the light and the van opened up. They're about to shoot. The, Rick told his partner that was driving to press on the gas. They pulled out. They weren't. So here you have 
an individual that helped the government that had the streets looking for him, want to target and kill him. Then you had law enforcement that also, because of the embarrassment and the humiliation and the unlawful action of what they did, wanted probably him dead as well. Who is he going to run to? By the grace of God, that's the only thing that, that saved Rick Worshi. By the grace of God. He would have been dead already. He had no protections from law enforcement who he helped. He had no protections from the streets that he was in. He was a target for everybody. It was a free-for-all. He had dangerous, very powerful politicians, police that wanted him dead. He had other individuals in the streets that wanted him dead. It's by the grace of God that Rick Worsh is standing here today before all of you to understand the, 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 the vendetta, the, the danger, the absolute hell that he had to encourage, he had to go through to be here today. Let me go on. So here I am. They told him, they told him, that is the FBI in Detroit, we got your back. Don't worry. We're go in this. We're just outside and what have you. Him being a child, which cannot even drive a vehicle, doesn't have a driver license, can't sign a contract, yet they said, you're good, don't worry about it. Go in these homes and we got your back. After they put him in this lifestyle, they put him in this world, what did they expect was going to happen? And they promised them, if you ever have this situation, we got your back. We will help you. That never happened. <clears throat> it is in the opinion of the plaintiff that he was set up with the drugs that got him over 650 uh, grams of cocaine that set him up, that led him to, at that time, with the state of Michigan, had the life, life or law, life in jail without parole. The drugs weren't found on him when they arrested him. They went back and said, A, B, C, and they, oh, here's the drugs, here, they, what have you. He was basically a lone wolf in the lion's den with no one, basically, to protect him. They could do what the hell they wanted to, and that's exactly what they did. Now come 1987, when he got sentenced, 88. 80, 80, 88, yeah. 88, he got sentenced to life in jail. Remind you, this is a crime that he committed supposedly when he was 17 years old, a minor. Life in jail without a chance of parole. Spirits obviously are down, he's depressed. Who approaches him once again in 1991-92? This time, which we call in our complaint, Chapter 2, is the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Michigan. It said, Rick, you know these people. Help us, and we'll help you. The quid pro quo. Help us get the corruption and by public figures and the Detroit Police Department that's tearing the city apart Help us bring them down, and we assure you that we will help you. We will assure you that we'll give you commute your sentence. We're the federal government. We can do what we want. Rick, looking at life and sentence, said, okay, I will do this. But they assured him that, that whatever you say through these grand jury testimonies is that it's, it's private, it's not going to be released, it can never be used against you. You all remember Bill Cosby, how he got out. Kind of same idea. They make you a promise, and you rely on it, and do what you do, and then they use it against you. So, that's fundamental law. There's agreement by the government to do A, B, and C, and you take it. he done such a good job with Operation Backbone, where they brought to justice a number of corrupt police officers and higher-ups that they said, Rick, 
come now and help us on the operations with this criminal enterprise, best friends, gangsters, drug dealers, killers, murderers, help us with them. Again, they said, we assure you, your grand jury testimony would not be released, and we would got your back, and we would help you to commit your sentence. He did that. Took a number of years, but he did that, and they eventually broke down the best friends network gangsters. All of this in the interest of this community, southeastern Michigan, and our society as a whole, to help the good people, law enforcement. Now, come the, the law is changed by Governor Angler back in 1998. Governor Angler signs says, this is, this is crazy. We can't have minors being sentenced to life without prison. He puts a cap on 15 years. If you're an adult, 20 years, but 15 years for a minor. This is Rick Worsh has been in jail now for about 10 years. So come 2002, they petition. 2003 is eligible for parole. Now he has his opportunity to cash in his chips with the federal government, with the Detroit police and all, and say, help me now. I have helped you. I'm in this situation because of you. Now help me. Not only did they not help him, but they released the unlawful grand jury testimony to make sure that he never gets out of jail and presented that at his parole hearing board in 2003. Just think about that. This individual from a child has put his life, has got shot, has attempted assassinations against him all these years. Even in jail, they had to put him in a witness protection program. He had the cops after him. He had the powerful politicians against him. He had the killers and the murders against him. And he had done all that because you put him in that situation. And yet, they couldn't even go up to the parole board and say, let this man out. It's time. It's time. This ain't Rwanda or, or Ghana or any other third world country. This is the United States of America. We help the people that we help us. We stand by our contracts and agreements as law enforcement and federal agencies. We need informants. Everyone in law enforcement tells you how important law enforcement is to get the bad guys off the street. But no, that rule, that law, that contract, that agreement never applied to Rick Wershey. Never. Because you know why? I said this earlier. The chickens have come back to roost. And they know that they used unlawfully a child as an informant they abused reused this child over and over again they didn't want that out said hey you know best thing we don't want this public let's keep him in jail maybe someone will kill him maybe he'll rot in jail who the hell cares about rick worshi i can't think of something more outrageous, the atrocities. What is child support, I mean, what is child abuse if it's not child abuse against Rick Wershe? That's what they did. That's what they did. That was him at 14. That's him when he got out. Actions have consequences. This is what they did to this person. They took his life. They literally took his life. And I don't give a damn about no statute of limitations or some kind of rule that says you can't bring this, this, or that, what have you. We were able to find out that there is something so egregious that this shocks the conscience of an ordinary society 
that this individual can beat the statute of limitations when he has, they've been retaliating against them. There's a threat of retaliation. The retaliation is real. The person is in custody. Absolutely, this individual is not going to say anything all those years. Absolutely, he's not going to sue the government. He did at one time with his prior counsel, God bless his soul, that has passed this last year, did file to be released, did sue the parole board, not the FBI, not the U.S. Attorney's Office, not the Detroit Police, not the city of Detroit, but sued the parole, parole board just to get out because that's what the law said. You can get out now. Finally, after the United States Sixth Circuit reversed and said, you got to look at this case that came out of uh, Florida, Florida versus Graham, it said basically that you got to consider these considerations. He's a minor at the time. Finally, they resolved and they let him out. But they didn't just let him out that easily. So, oh, you have a racketeering charge back in, uh, from Florida. You're going to have to do, go do five years over there. Again, the racketeering charge. They literally threatened, they said, if you don't plead, we're going to indict your mom and we're going to indict your sister. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about is not just the speculation of these individuals having the power to hurt this individual. This is not speculation. This is real. It actually happened. Said, you're going to do this. From the time they reneged on their deal from helping him when he was a minor, from the time that they reneged on their deal when he helped to testify, the grand jury, had the grand jury testimony with the Operation Backbone for the corrupt individuals and the Best Friends Network gangs, all of that, he's already known what they can do. Come now uh, with the situation in Florida. So he doesn't want his mom. He loves his mom. He loves his, he's not going to make that happen. So he took it. Another five years. And guess what? When he went to Florida, you can't, you're not supposed to. It's illegal to do more than 30 days in the hole. You know how many days they put him in the hole? 16 months. One year, four months in the hole. That's what he did. But I want you to appreciate the significance of this. I really do. See, Rick Wirsch is not no ordinary guy. He's not no Joe Schmo or Joe Mo or have you. Rick Wershey is headstrong. He said it before. They took my body. They never took my head. They never took my brain. They took his body. Absolutely. If it was anyone else, they would have broke down. They would have killed somebody. They wanted. That's what they were hoping that Rick Wershey would do. It's break down. We can break them down after 16 months in the hole. Anyone will be broken down. He'll go crazy. He'll stab somebody. He'll do something. He didn't do that. Because Rick Wershey is headstrong. Headstrong in the sense that all those years, almost 33 years, he stayed headstrong. He's come out, not a bitter man, but he's come out to help individuals. He works with an organization called Team Wellness, Help the Mentally Impaired, working on justice reform, working on prison reform. He's been there. He knows. He knows like the back of his hand. He knows what the issues are. I'm going to pretty much finish up with this. Had the U.S. Attorney's Office said, Rick, we're going to abide by our end of the bargain, and come to your 2003 parole hearing and say, this man helped us in this, 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 and that. Forget about the time we child abused him, but when he helped us with all this, uh, well, he needs to be out of jail. They didn't do that. Had they done that, 17 years, 17 long, hard, hell of years would have been saved for this man. They didn't do that. They were hoping he dies in jail. They were hoping someone kills him in jail. They were hoping their story will never get out. Never. Because they knew what they did wrong. Morally, ethically, principally, God-given right, they knew what they, what they did was wrong. 
You know, I've had many civil rights cases over the years, of my 21 years as a former civil rights commissioner of the state and, and other organizations and what have you. And there's some horrible cases, but in all sense it, I've never seen as a civil rights attorney in my history of 21 years in practice, the outrageous conduct that's happened here to Rick Wershe. But you know, I'm not trying to paint this picture, the FBI is horrible people, the U.S. attorneys are horrible individuals. I think they got themselves deep in a hole. They got themselves in a hole and they didn't know how to get out of it. And guess what? The greatest scapegoat in this case was Rick Wershe. He could have died a number of times. They could have done all the whole, whole thing. They, they thought that he would never come back to haunt them again. Statue of limitations and things of this nature. Justice cries for this individual to have his day in court. He's never brought suit against the federal government, Detroit police, or the assistant United States attorney's office because of that. So, we have a statement. This is just not me as his attorney or Rick Wershe speaking or anyone else speaking. We have a statement from the FBI agent that had witness to all of this, Mr. Gregory Schwartz, who says in his statements, he knew, he knew that the government reneged on their deal. He said what their help. We have video of him saying he absolutely was absolutely imperative to the investigations of how they brought these individuals down. This is not just Joe Schmo or a friend of Rick or anyone. This is a Federal Bureau of Investigation of who's still working with the FBI with contracts, assuring due diligence and investigating judges. This person is reputable, honest, and he said this is what's going on. This is why it's important to know what has happened to this kid. And we filed a federal lawsuit this morning. Uh, we got dealt Laura Michelson, federal judge, and um, we intend to aggressively pursue these 11 counts of constitutional violations from, in, from indoctrinating into a criminal enterprise of the defendant, due process, Fifth Amendment, Fourth Amendment seizure. He wasn't free to go. It's the FBI and the, he wasn't. That, that, that's seizure. The same as you were in prison, that's, that's a uh, Fourth Amendment violation. First Amendment, the Family Association, Monell liability on the city of Detroit. Uh, the list goes on and on. We did file a FTCA claim just yesterday. Uh, that is still pending. If you see a lot of these complaints, uh, the defendants are individual in nature outside the city of Detroit, as well as the uh, 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 individual police officers. So you got two police officers from the city of Detroit, the city of Detroit under Monell liability, custom and policy. You got two FBI agents. You got uh, two assistant United States attorneys that we know of. Uh, and again, agent, uh, FBI agent Schwartz talks about these two, uh, uh, at least uh, Mr. James King and Leland, Haland, both these individuals. So we're just not making this up. This is not something that we have FBI agents saying this is what happened to him. Uh, and lastly, we have the unknown former assistant United States, United States attorney that actually released the grand jury so they can lock him up and keep him locked up for many, many years, additional 17 years. So that said, I want to turn it over to Rick Borshi uh, to make some comments. Um, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to William Savage after that. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry Stelgato, uh, former state senator. So come on, please. Wait, go ahead, please. <clears throat> Listen. The justice system hasn't been fair to me over the last 33 years. I'm hoping now that this is the last book where I can close this chapter, go on with my life. But I think this needed to be done. I think the truth absolutely needed to be told. I think the people that did this to me need to be held accountable. I'm not blaming the people that are in office now. I'm not blaming the U.S. Attorney's Office that's here now. I'm blaming the people from the past the people that did it to me, the retired FBI agents, the retired DPD officials, 
the, the retired U.S. attorney that released my grand jury testimony. Everybody says that, that some of you right here have made claims about me that are further from the truth. They shock your conscience to say that I did these things as a child, that I was in charge of organizations. Alan, you sit here, you were the reporter at the Detroit News back then. A reporter put me at the head of the Best Friends organization, put it on the national media that, that I was the leader of an organization that was responsible for over 100 murders. That couldn't be further from the truth. I knew him, I grew up in the same neighborhood, never ran with him, never, never did anything, was never mentioned in their indictment. There's been things that have been said that my mother was ashamed of, that my kids were ashamed of. And this is the final closure where we get to say what the truth really is and we can prove what the truth really is. We're not making up anything. We're not making allegations. Everything that we say will be backed up by documents and FBI agents. That's all I have to say. We'll, we'll get back to it. Uh, Sherry, yeah, please. So thank you. A, a threat to justice anywhere, anywhere is a, a threat to justice everywhere. Um, as a former Detroit public school teacher, middle school teacher to be exact, just thinking about the mindset of a 15-year-old. A 15-year-old that would have to carry the weight of the world on his shoulder and fear not only for his life, for his mother's life, for his family's life, uh, and to have to make these decisions uh, with the highest law enforcement agency in the country. That's no easy feat. Uh, at 54, I don't know what that would feel like to me uh, if I had to deal with something so egregious. And so it's important, it's incumbent upon all of us as a former legislator, I am appreciative of it being a bipartisan issue to address juvenile justice reform. Uh, that's a very important issue. We see, as pointed out by Attorney Nabi, that Governor Engler made steps to do that. We see a recent press conference with our current governor addressing that. We see former legislators uh, that I worked with in the House put forward packages of bills to address juvenile criminal justice reform. It's unacceptable that we would allow this to go on, not just for Rick Worshi, but for any child that is facing similar outcomes and issues uh, with our law enforcement agencies. And so it's in incumbent upon us to address this. And some people say, well, why, why now? Why a lawsuit? It's not just about the pain, the mental suffering uh, that Rick and his family has endured, but what else lies beneath the systems that we all rely on and trust? How many other young people have faced similar situations. That's what has to be addressed here. I have to say, though, that I am extremely proud as a co-worker to work with Rick on criminal justice reform, being one of the uh, sponsors of the Clean Slate package. Rick has availed himself in such meaningful ways to make sure that we work on and address expungement for so many, to make sure that we address the wraparound services for young people who are in our foster care system him understanding even in prison that a greater percentage of people who are in our pipeline to prison come from foster care systems. And so this is a person that hasn't come out angry. This is a person that's come out trying to determine how can I help? Feeding the hungry, making sure that his nephew goes down into Eastern Market where one of our offices is and seeing what people live like. Taking them back to the neighborhood where he came from, seeing the issues, giving away clothes, giving away food, giving away resources, helping a friend who's a paraplegic, looking for ways to build a ramp so they have a way to get in. He's not angry. When you have one-on-one -on -one conversations, he's trying to find a way to make his life, the, the pain and suffering that he endured, a, a pathway and a light to guide those so they would never ever have to deal with situations like that. And so the sensitivity that he has, the commitment to our community and the commitment to transform lives, he should be supported in this effort to uncover through discovery what else we might find that lies beneath. So I'm thankful for his family, his mom that are standing here today, but as his coworker, I'm proud to stand with him as on this path to uncover the truth, to really gain his reputation and his life back, and so that he can continue doing the work that is necessary in criminal justice reform. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, thank you, Sherry. Then I have William Savage from my office as well that has to make a few comments. Sure, thank you. Well, I think uh, everything I was gonna say has been said better by Nabi and Sherry here, but I will just say, 
we already know the answer to this question, but it's time we have the justice system answer this question. Do you, as an American, have a constitutional right to not have the government turn your child into a drug dealer? Thank you. Well said and to the point. Questions, please. Orlando. Hi, yes, uh, Mr. Warsh, you are Lander from Detroit News. I just wanted to ask you, what has it been like trying to get your life back together after more than three decades? We've not heard from you at all since you were released a year ago today. So what has it been like trying to get your life back on track after being locked up for so long? It's been difficult. I, I lost... I lost 33 years of my life. My father's not here. Uh, a lot of my family members aren't here. I didn't get to see my kids grow up. And I guess the best statement after being in a cage for almost 33 years is I saw the world evolve, but I didn't get to play any part in it. I saw my kids grow up, but I didn't get to play any part of it. It's almost like being dead but you see the world evolve around you. you. You see the world change and you see the technology and you see or you read about it, but you play absolutely no part of it. You know, Orlando, and this is, you know, this is just not a, 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 a sentence of Rick Worshi in all sincerity. It was a sentence for his mom. That was her only son. It was a sentence for his mom. She lost her child. This was my mom when I left. That was my mom. And thank you for pointing that beautiful, out. Beautiful, young. Look at my mom. This Still is beautiful. Right. Still beautiful, but this is what they took from me. My dad never knew I made it out of jail, Orlando. People blame my dad for a lot of things. And I promise you, 90% of the things they blame my dad for are lies. They, that's their lies to cover up the truth. My dad never knew the depth that I was, what I was doing for the government. He never knew that I was, that I had a fake ID that said I was 21 years old. He never knew that I was out all night because he was waking up in the morning trying to provide for our family. And I lived upstairs in the two family flat. He wasn't the best father, but he wasn't what he was made out to be. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. the FBI gave you that ID. I got a question. You, you obviously had a hard, you, you were promised a lot of things, then you went into jail. You, your whole adult life has been in jail. How do you trust people coming out now? Do you have much trust for people in, in, in general? Is it hard to trust people? Well, if my other half, if you ask her, no, I don't trust people. And I've known you for a long time. I've talked to you for years in prison. Right. And, and I'll say this in here in front of everybody. I felt like you betrayed me, and I quit talking to you. And, 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 and let me finish. And now that I'm here in front of you and I had time to think about it, you didn't betray me. You were telling a story. So a lot of the things, it was accurate. Um, I, I've never said you didn't say anything accurate. I, I, I responded to a story that you wrote the wrong way. I had been locked up a long time, Alan. I know you always tried to tell the truth. And I know that you know more of the truth that you didn't tell because you're, you're friends with a lot of the FBI agents that we're talking about, or you knew them, I won't say friends. But there was far more of the story that could have been told that wasn't told. Maybe because it couldn't be proven, maybe because they didn't want you to or whatever. But I'm just being honest with you in front of everybody. And that's all you'll get from me is honesty. I appreciate it. Wait, can you talk about why this is so important for you to file this lawsuit and get this accountability so that you can continue on living a healthy life, the life that you want to live from here on out? I want this chapter of my life closed. I want, I want to forget about it. I want it to be gone. I'm not going to lie to you. You know me. You know Nabi. This was hard for me to do. I wasn't going to do it. I didn't, I, I, it didn't, I didn't come out and say, I want to sue these people. I come out and try and help people. I come out and every week I try and do something good in the community. So I'm not bitter. 
Well, I'm bitter a little. I'm not going to say I'm not bitter at all. I'm bitter a little <laughs> about missing out on my kids' lives, about not being able to see my father when he was dying, about not being able to be a part of my mother's lives. You know, I have grandkids that I've never met to this day because they live in another state. So I guess I just want to put this behind me, and I think this is the final chapter in it, and whatever it is, I get to close the book. It wasn't until Greg Schwartz came forward and, and basically told the truth and said, listen, the government was, you know, responsible for what happened and we need to tell the truth. And Greg was the first one that came forward and, and you know, tried to get other people to tell the truth. And I think Alan knows that. He was like, this is wrong. You know, I, I was sitting in prison. I watched. Nate Kraft, who admitted to 30 murders, they honored their promise to him. He did 17 years, he admitted to 30 murders. Forget about all the other crimes that he committed. He admitted to 30 murders in our community. Tell about the Why were his promises kept? Some of the gangsters don't I, have it. I, I, I truly believe the only reason that I stayed in prison 30 years was because I told on corruption in the city of Detroit. There's, there's no other reason for me to be kept in prison. I was in prison. I met guys in prison that were indicted in Michigan for seven tons of cocaine. You don't know their name. None of you in here know their name. But they received an 11-year sentence. But they called me a drug kingpin. They called my friend who was 16 years old a drug kingpin. 16 and 17 years old, we were called drug kingpins. Who in their right mind? Labels someone a 16 and 17 year old a drug kingpin. Pablo Escobar is a drug kingpin. El Chapo is a drug kingpin. 50 kilos of cocaine doesn't make you a drug kingpin. Seven tons of cocaine might make you a drug kingpin. If any of you disagree with me, please, I'd love to hear your argument. Charlie, I knew you'd have something to say. <laughs> It seems that most of it has to do with you being upset at 14 to becoming part of the system. I think that's probably right. And then at 14, nobody should become a drug informant. That's kind of what I'm getting at. But let me ask you this. Are you proud of the work that you did do to help the government bust all these terrible, terrible games? And if you are, if you are, are you no, more upset that the government didn't try to do something for you to get you out of prison sooner? Like years and years sooner. Listen, am I proud of it? Yes. I'm proud that I helped the city rid corruption out of their police department. I'm proud that, that murderers were taken off the street or dangerous individuals. But it's a double-edged sword because... Mr. Egan from the parole board thanked me for my cooperation, was the first one ever that thanked me. He's a former prosecutor. He stood up and he said, I commend you for the police corruption that you helped get rid of. I commend you for, for the other cooperation. No one ever did that, Charlie. Even when I got to Florida, the prosecutor said, what'd they do for you? Everything you did for that city, what'd they do for you? And the true answer is, they kept me, I was punished more severely for my crime because of my cooperation. I didn't do 33 years in prison because of the drug crime I committed. I did 33 years in prison because I told on corruption in the city. Right. Make that 100% clear. That's why I did 33 years in prison, because I told on the powers that be. And I was too young and dumb to know that it would affect the rest of my life or that it would affect my kid's life, or that it would affect my mother's life, or that I'd never see my father again. 
Yeah, Rick, who, who do you think was behind that? Was it Gil Hill? Was it the mayor? Was it... I, 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 I'm not comfortable with them asking that question, answering that question. It, all in the complaint basically spells it out. All the complaints spells it out. We know Gil was responsible for a large part of it. We, we know that. I, I won't say more than that, but we, we know, Alan, you better than anybody know about the Damian Lucas saga. And, and you know about the bribes that were paid, and they were admitted that they were paid by drug dealers. They admitted to the government, I paid this bribe, and not one thing was ever done about that. Killing what, a 12-year-old? A 12-year-old or a 13-year-old uh, innocent lost his life. And they tried to put an innocent person in prison. And when I stood up and said, hey, this man didn't do this, I was persecuted for it. But nobody says anything that, that the person that paid the bribe, that we have a letter from Jimmy Harris saying he was present when the bribe was paid. And Jimmy Harris is one of the officers that went to jail. Jimmy said, I was there when this bribe was paid. Still nothing was done about it. But Rick Worsey sat in prison for almost 33 years for a nonviolent drug crime. And I'm not proud, Charlie, of any crime I committed. Let me make that clear. You, you watch drug dealers go on and brag about the amounts of drugs they sold, about the amounts of money they made. You never heard me in one interview brag about anything. And when I speak to these kids and they ask me that, I never answer what it was. I don't tell them, did I have a bunch of fancy cars? Yeah, I was a kid. I love cars. I love cars now. You love cars. I still have fancy cars, but this time they can't take any of them from me. Mr. Horsey, one question I've been wanting to ask you for a very long time. My photographer and I talked about this morning when we said we're going to cover this and put this on the news. We were saying there's a way of covering this and putting it on the news without using three words, white force. I've always wondered. That label was put on me by the powers that be. I suffered from it for 32 years and seven months. Now, if I can use that name as a platform to do some good, that's what I'm gonna do with it. I'm proud of the work I do. I'm proud of the work I do with Sherry. That's why she's here standing by my side. This morning, I did an interview about prison reform. I'm proud of the work I do in the community. I don't call you guys when I'm giving out food with my nephew. I could call. I was doing it eight years from prison. People said, oh, he's doing this from prison. I've done more in a year than I did in eight years from prison, and I'll continue to do it. I've had people in the community come to me and say, why'd you come back here after what they did to you? Why are you doing this? The people in the community didn't do it to me. Corruption did what they did to me. So the people in the community, I love where I'm from. All I get is love when I'm in the city. People stopped today, took pictures, honked their horn. It, people know that what was done to me was an injustice. And if you're from the city, if you're not from the city, whatever. There's going to be good and bad said. I could care less what the bad is. All I care, I don't, I don't focus on the negative things. People that focus on negative things, they're small-minded people. Me and Sherry are working together on some prison reform issues. I work with Team Wellness, which is a, a drug rehabilitation, mental health. We have a halfway house setting. We just opened a place in Westland that, that Sherry spearheaded for an all-women's facility. Uh, we're trying to get into the foster care system because the one thing I want to say is in prison, probably half of the people you meet, the younger generation, at 18 years old, you're kicked out of the foster care system. So it's kind of like a pipeline right to prison. For the girls, it's a pipeline right to the street of, of being abused. For the men, it's more of a pipeline that you're going to do what you have to do to survive. These kids want to eat. They want a roof over their head. Some of them turn to drug dealing. Some of them turn to robbery. We just need to correct. If, if we truly care about the youth today, we need to correct the systems that are failing them. And the foster care system is one that's failing greatly. A quick question for the attorney. Um, you are suing, are you you're suing the individuals and 
not not the FBI, not the U.S. Attorney's Office. Why? Am I correct there? There's a process. Uh, I think Rick said it earlier. This is not something that's easily taken to bring the suit about and reopening all those traumatic doors for him. Uh, finally got to where he made up his mind to go after and do this. Um, with that said, we ended up filing the FTCA claim. You need to file an FTCA claim that was filed yesterday before you bring your exhaustion, which is called the FTCA, before you step into federal court and say uh, the F FBI, the U.S. Stern, the United States of America are st as defendants. So that said, that, that's the purpose. So individually, that probably down the road will most likely change to the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office and other agencies. I'm, I'm sorry, can you clarify what an FTCA claim is? It's a Federal Tort Claims Act. It basically gives the rules if, you know, the, the government, the United States government could only, you can only sue them if they tell you you can sue me, all right? And uh, by that matter is that uh, uh, you have to file what's called the FTCA administrative claim first and serve the parties that are involved, like the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. And after that, they have six months to make a decision. From there, once they make a decision, then you can go ahead and bring suit in federal court of it. So most likely there will be an amended complaint down the road due to the time restrictions. Would your mom want to comment, Mr. Warshi? She's got anything brief to say. You want to say anything, Mom? I'm glad he's home. I don't know how much time I have left to be around, but I'm happy he's here with me. Let me tell you. You want to tell them about that Tupac song we were listening to, either? <laughs> 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 so I, I just want to tell you that the individual, you know, you know, Rick said he's not bitter. He's not. He really truly is. Wherever, wherever, and I've had multiple dinners with him. Wherever he goes, I mean, he's always trying to help. He's doing GoFundMe for an individual that's in jail out of North Carolina. He's doing a uh, GoFundMe for an individual that's a paraplegic that can't get out of the wheelchair. And they need, he needs a van, so he's working to raise money for him to get a van. He's uh, 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 the one lady that's dying of cancer said, you know, I want to meet, you know, white, white boy Rick. And he didn't just call her, just come up and say hello. He actually took her out for the whole day. Took her for lunch, took her, spent the whole day with her. She was so impressed by this individual. This is an older lady that's dying of cancer, and that's, that's, that's who this individual is. That's his character. That's his nature. And this is what our government and our powers that be. She's passed on, so she has passed to her family, yeah, so, deepest yeah, respect. Yeah, this is all within the last number of months, so. This is, this is who this individual is. I mean, in all sincerity, and I tell you again and again, had he not had a head, strong head on him, I tell you, he would never have survived this. And the, and the powers that be would have got what they wanted, and the request you won't be out here today. Rick, you've been awake for a long time. Do you have nightmares about prison still? Yes. Absolutely. Hey, listen, I went to a, a CPR group recently, it's Citizens for Prison Reform. And they were playing the sounds. They had a cell set up. And they were playing sounds that they had taken off the internet of, of uh, like solitary confinement. You never forget those sounds, Alan. I lived that for 32 years and seven months. I, I, I lived screaming and beating on the door and, and, and seeing people cut themselves because they couldn't take it. And, and, seeing him take the guy across the hall from me out because he hung himself because he didn't have, you know, the, the, the mental capacity to handle what he was going through. So, yeah, I've, listen, I've sleepless nights. I'm not going to tell you <laughs> that, that, that my life's perfect, but after 32 years and seven months, I was still blessed. Amen. I, I, I was blessed to come out what I came out to. I, I, every morning, a, a good friend of mine sends me a daily read, and that's how I start my day, that people don't know. And like I said, I try and do something good every week because I'm not going to forget about the people that are in there that shouldn't be in there. That's not me. And, and people have asked me, I truly believe that half of the people in prison could be released and society would be just as safe as it is. And I've asked judges. I've talked to a Supreme Court judge since I've been home. I've talked to prosecutors. And the one question that I ask is if you could help me wrap my head around 
How does a child molester get five years, but a nonviolent drug offender gets 30 years? And nobody can give me a, a, an answer. There's, there's no, I, I just, I thought I was missing something, like someone could help me wrap my head around it. But, and I'm not saying that drugs, drugs tear up communities. They destroy communities. But I came home and these big pharmaceutical companies, they created an epidemic out here. You have kids dying every day because they can't get the pills that pharmaceutical companies prescribe to them. So now they're turning to heroin and you have scumbags that are selling heroin tainted with fentanyl. So, but all this was started not by a street level drug dealer. This was started by big pharmaceutical companies, Alan. So if you wanna talk about a cartel, okay, the Mexicans have their cartels. What do we have? What do we have in America? What are these multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies that, that sell fentanyl patches or sell oxycodone or, or any other opioid that wasn't here when I left, by the way, and I came out to this drug epidemic that shocks anybody's conscious, that, that you have kids in Birmingham that, that are addicted to heroin because they stole some of their mother's pills and, and became addicted instantly. That's not a crime. So I mean, just to go back to, you know, the first couple of weeks that he was in jail, in prison, uh, while I was speaking to his mom, he witnessed an attempted murder. I mean, somebody came, stabbed another inmate right in the neck. That's, that's, that's the first couple of weeks, like, uh, welcome to prison. Uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that he had to endure initially uh, and moving forward. So, yeah, prison is not a pretty place for sure. I got to help. Justin Timberlake with his movie Palmer. I got to, to help him a little bit talking about prison. And that was one of the stories that Nabi just told you. I think it was my first night in Ionia at Michigan Reformatory. And I was on the phone and I saw the kid next to me get stabbed in the neck. And I told my mom, I said, listen, I'll call you tomorrow. And I hung up and I'll never forget the guard told me. He said, get ready, where is she? Because that's every day. And, and that's the world that people that don't belong in there have to endure every day. It's, it's, we sit here, and I, when we leave here, Alan, we can stop and get a coffee, or, or I can drink this water. A lot of the people that I call my friends that are still locked up in prison, they don't have that privilege. They're stuck in a cell 23 hours a day. And, and we claim we spend $2 billion a year on our prison industry. I did a lot of reading, I did a lot of soul searching, and I was a young, stubborn person. And, and <laughs> I'm still stubborn, that's why they're laughing, all of them, Sherry included. But I just put in my mind, Alan, that I would never let them see me break. And when it, it, I broke down in there, but I never let anybody see it. You know, I, I had, I call it peaks and valleys, and I tried to have more peaks than valleys. And if you can do that, you have a chance. And by the grace of God, I made it. That's it. All right. And if, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, this was not easy, I can tell you, for Rick Worsh and his family. So please appreciate the significance of who he's after and who he's looking to do what they've done, that they've done to him all these years. So thank you. God bless you all. We just need the first and last name of uh, Mrs. Worsh. Darlene McCormick, M C C O R M I C K. Darlene D A R L E N E. N E, yes, ma'am. If any of you want one of these pictures, I'd be happy to sign them for a small donation. No, I'm just joking. <laughs>